time. Is it good afternoon, everyone? Now, when I heard about this lecture series, Defense Against the Dark Arts, I was very intrigued. For those who are Harry Potter fans, truly understand that resonated with me. Um, so when I was invited, I actually thought I was coming to a job interview to be the professor of the Against Defense, Defense, Defense Against the Dark Arts because in the Harry Potter series, every year there's a new professor. So I figured this year is my opportunity to come up here and show you muggles or for you magic worlds exactly what it is we can do. So I'm going to, I don't have to use this today. So I'm, I'm actually, I'm, I'm going to put it away. I'm going to be very good today it's because I don't have to do any, I don't have to put a Patronus or anything on anyone like that. So I'm going to begin my remarks because I understand we're in a safe space. So it is um, my absolute pleasure to welcome you to Kane's inaugural art history lecture series event. Whether you consider yourself an art historian, art student, or art appreciator, this unique lecture will take you on a magical journey through past civilizations. And when I say magical, I mean literally magical. Defense Against the Dark Arts, you may recognize that from the fictional Harry Potter course, course in Harry Potter, will build on tales and fiction to explore the real magical practices of ancient civilizations. You may know this about me already, but I already indicated I'm a big Harry Potter fan, so this, this drew me here, so I could not wait. And to be honest with you, my schedule, I apologize, but it's because of my schedule that we have moved this around a few times because I really wanted to be here to support the professor. So I see myself as a Gryffindor. I have my colors on today. Yeah. Right, my colors. I have my tie. Because I really, I mean, I'm in character today, right? Uh, but I do have a little hint of Slytherin in me. Right? And I had made my wife stand up for second, First Lady Darlene. I made her wear green today. She's in a Slytherin house. Thank you for coming out. You might even find a magical wand or two in my office. I have actually four of them, um, magical wands. So the bottom line is I'm really looking forward to this. So thank you, Jacqueline. I like how magic dares us to stretch our imagination, to envision the seemingly impossible, and at times even make it happen. It's a similar boundless curiosity that drives us here at Kane, New Jersey's Urban Research University, and fuels our work as we endeavor to achieve Carnegie R2 research status. It would be nice if we could wave a wand at our challenges and watch them resolve themselves, but real life isn't as easy as a well-timed enchantment from Hermione Granger. I have found the real magic lies in us, working collaboratively to address the issues facing our campus, our state, and ultimately our world. Art history enables us to connect with people in the past through creations and visual expressions. Art historians celebrate creativity and craftsmanship, explore language, beliefs, and cultures, and reflect on existing societal values. This semester, we've taken a step into the past to better understand our present and prepare for the future with the course Magical Amulets, Defense Against the Dark Arts, taught by Dr. Jacqueline Turk-Stornberg. Tonight, she will offer us a glimpse behind the, certain, the curtain of a course as she unveils the intricate relationships between ancient societies and their magical traditions, offering us insights into their complex lives. Dr. Stormberg, Turk Stormberg invites us to ponder the similarities between ourselves and those ancient civilizations to reflect on how we navigate life's challenges and to consider what lessons we can draw from their magical practices today. Thank you, uh, Dr. Tor Stormberg, for creating this art history lecture series and for inspiring us to bridge the gap between the past, present, and through creativity and curiosity. So we're going to let the magic begin. But when I mentioned to you that I love the intersection between art history, art, the past. I'm a big fan of Dan Brown, the books, right, the stories. I even took my family to, um, to, to the Louvre to follow the Rose Line, right, because I truly wanted to see the intersection between religion and history. And for us to be able to talk about the past and what it means today and to look at some of those secrets, those amulets, those drawings, and come up with our own interpretation of it. But more importantly, the magic part is really when you find out the reasons, the clues that they've left us, right? The conversations and the black culture we talked about standing on the shoulders of our giants and our ancestors in the past. And I think art history gives you a glimpse into those ancestors, into what they were talking about, 
the lives that they lived, their shared experiences. And through courses like this, you get to find the magic, right? And I think to today, I, when I mean I was looking forward to this lecture series, I'm serious, I'm geeking out right about now, right? And, and just is to hear this, because I think it's a good opportunity for us to see exactly what the past and what magic has in store for us. So enjoy it this evening, and thank you very much. I'm Dr. Jacqueline Turk Stoneberg, and I teach art history here at Kane University. I'm an expert on ancient and medieval magic, and I thank you for coming today, especially in the rain. This is the inauguration or the first meeting of the new art history lecture series. Special thanks are owed to Dr. Lamont Repolette for his very poetic and very touching welcoming address, for the generous banquet that's in the back of the room. And those of you in the back of the room, there are some seats up here. You can even come and take my seat here. Please come. It'll be, it'll be too uh, tedious for you to have to stand. And I also want to thank Dr. Lamont Repolette for his continual encouragement and support of research here at Kane University. My research was made possible through generous sabbatical leave at Kane University that I took last academic year. Thank you for that, Dr. Repolette. And through this research, I just received a Fulbright Award as a specialist to study and teach overseas about magical amulets. I credit the research that I did during my sabbatical leave with getting this uh, Fulbright, and I want to thank you for that as well, Dr. Repolette. Now, <clears throat> I titled my talk, Defense Against the Dark Arts, after a specific class at Hogwarts in the Harry Potter books, because many of us have come to appreciate and uh, have an interest in magic through these books and their heroes and their villains. But these books are fiction, the products of an individual author's imagination, whereas magic was practiced by real people throughout real history defending against real fears and desires with real rituals, spells, and amulets. Knowing this and myself being deeply curious about magic, I traveled to 88 different museums across Africa, Asia, Europe, North America in search of real magical amulets and spells. And I found plenty, thousands of them. The talk I'm giving today is the result of my recent research for three international conference papers, two published articles, and one book that's in progress right now called Byzantine Magic, all generously supported by Kane's commitment to research. My working main idea that I bring to all my investigations of magical amulets and spells is that language, whether verbal, visual, or performative, roots the communicator within a community. Language can be understood as the product of finding and creating meaning in signs by relating them to something in the world. Language is powerful enough to shape experience and to express and thus realize one's own feelings. And it can do, and, and it can do so communally through recognition by others, whether those others are people, gods, or demons. <clears throat> language aimed toward gods and demons often appears on magical objects and were designed to realize desires, needs, and fears. These amulets were common and widespread throughout the Mediterranean and across centuries, which is evident from the sheer abundance of thousands of surviving material examples. These attest to the great numbers of producers and clients alike. Large communities believed in magical ob ob objects because they believed in the power of visual and verbal language to interpret human realities. Ritual power in the late antique Mediterranean was multicultural and multi-practical, rooted in Hebrew, Greek, 
Roman, Egyptian, Coptic, and Syrian traditions. In ancient Greek, the word magic, magi, was a wide-ranging topic which could involve an individual spell, epode, love potion, philtron, and amulets, pariapton, by a magician, magos, a soothsayer, mantis, di di dish diviners, laconamantis, and wise or deceptive men, hakatontorkoi. Scholars have debated the term magic for generations, applying the term to images and texts in healing, cursing, divination, and exorcisms. Today, the term magic is used by scholars to explore medical, religious, and household objects of ritual power. Our modern choice of terms shapes the very questions that we bring to these ancient objects. The study of magic is most productively understood as a choice of terms and a choice of questions to ask about the objects. The term magic is no longer used to mean incorrect science or incorrect religion. Magic overlaps rather than competes with religion and medicine. Magical thinking, regardless of venue, is an act of faith in which belief itself embedded in language is the seat of power. Magical thinking is apparent in thousands of healing and protective amulets, jewelry, textiles, pottery, papyrus, liturgies, and miraculous icons. Holy icons were credited with winning battles and healing diseases, but perhaps even more so than miracle-working Christian icons, amulets were relied upon for practical help and protection. About half of the ancient texts concerning magic reveal spells of healing and protection. These texts include the surviving magical texts themselves, ancient manuals on how to make amulets, and non-magical texts about magic. Other practical uses included spells for love and sex. Expectations for what amulets could do, however, does not explain how they did it, if at all. <clears throat> Several semiotic strategies contribute to the power of magical texts and images. <clears throat> In particular, the use of analogy was one such semiotic strategy to give authority to expression. This dark red hematite amulet made in Byzantine Egypt in the 6th century used analogy to cure uterine bleeding. It was designed to be worn around the neck, as you see from the loop at the top, and engraved with an image from the Christian Gospel of Mark of Jesus healing a woman with uterine bleeding. I analyzed this persuasive analogy on this amulet in an earlier publication. The amulet quotes from the Gospel of Mark, quote, and a woman with uterine bleeding suffered a lot and spent a lot of money without getting better. The inscription describes her failed attempts at a cure, whereas the image describes her successful cure, touching Jesus' garment. The gospel story continues on the other side of this same amulet. Quote, but instead of that, she knew that her blood was dried up in the name of her faith. With the inscription is the, am is, is the image of the female Orans with her hands raised like this in thanksgiving. The woman giving thanks is not mentioned in the gospel. And so this image may represent the medieval person who wore this amulet, expressing gratitude for an expected cure. The words and images create an analogy between the woman in the Bible story and the Byzantine person who wore this amulet, presumably to address uterine bleeding. The material of this blood-controlling stone is significant in that the hematite stone is linked analogically to the Greek word for blood, hema. This red-veined bloodstone was used to treat uterine bleeding across centuries and across the Mediterranean and was recommended by the ancient scientist Pliny the Elder from the first century in his book on biology called Natural History. 
and by the ancient medical doctor, Seranus of Ephesus, from the second century in his book called Gynecology. The hematite amulet's use of analogy stems from a much larger late antique context of analogy. In the ancient Hippocratic medical texts, analogy was a crucial part of medical practice in experimentation, diagno diagnosis, and treatment. These medical texts are dated variously through different centuries, and they're all attributed to a single medical doctor named Hippocrates who lived in the fifth century BCE, but that doesn't mean that all the Hippocratic texts were written by Hippocrates. For instance, the medical Hippocratic text on breaths makes analogy between the vapors of humors in the human body and boiling water. Another medical text, Hippocratic text, called On Diseases 4, explains the coagulation and separation of the humors with an analogy on how butter and cheese separate. And the ancient medical book on the nature of the child explains human gestation, how a fetus grows in the uterus through analogy with the formation of crust on bread. If only it were that easy. These Hippocratic analogies and scientific knowledge survived into late antiquity and through the Middle Ages through famous doctors, including Alexander of Tralles and Galen. Now, alongside Greek medical texts, rhetorical arts also make use of persuasive analogy. The rhetorician Philostratus lived in the second and third centuries and wrote a textbook called Images, which is on the rhetorical method of ekphrasis. It teaches that if a speaker can create an analogy between his subject and the audience, then that speech will be powerful enough to move the hearts and minds of his listeners. In philosophy, too, Greek sources commonly used analogy as a means to organize knowledge, as in the text on signs and inferences by the Epicurean philosopher Philodemus in the first century BCE and against the mathematicians by the doctor and semiotician Sextus Empiricus in the second century CE. Throughout ancient Greek and medieval thought, analogy was persuasive and authoritative. In the Greek tradition of persuasive analogy also appears it also appears in later late antique artworks that shape concepts of physical and spiritual well-being. Here you see an early Christian marriage ring that depicts the birth of Jesus as an analogy for one's own fertility in marriage. And catacomb paintings and the a catacomb coffin where a body was buried with outside of Rome with decorations that show sacred stories as an analogy for spiritual salvation of the people who lived in them. This is an analogy between sacred stories of spiritual salvation on one hand and the personal de desire for salvation of the people who are buried here. They give the visual statement, God save me, the way you saved Jonah from the sea monster. Here you see the sea monster, and you see Jonah here being thrown into the mouth of the sea monster, and then Jonah relaxing after the fact once he's been saved by God. So you have this metaphor. God save me the way you save Jonah from the sea monster. So now you can see that persuasive analogy on this hematite amulet is not unusual. The placement of the biblical text on the amulet associated the real life story of the Byzantine amulet wearer with the holy story from the Gospels. It's a visual statement, may Jesus heal the, me the medieval woman who wears this amulet, as he healed the woman from the biblical story. By understanding the persuasive analogy of the hematite amulet, we can better understand the function of other powerful words and images to persuade and empower, such as those on magical spells. Now we get to the good stuff. This fifth century papyrus amulet contains drawings and demonic characters with a text that reads that I, I translate for you. Christ arose, amen. He's woken to judge the living and the dead. You too, fever, was shivering, F flee from kale. That's the name of the person who wore this amulet. Flee from kale who wears this amulet. And then their drawings and characters. 
holy inscription and mighty signs, chase away the, my fever with shivering. Now, 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 quickly, quickly, quickly. That quickly, quickly, quickly is in thousands of magical spells. This inscription makes the persuasive analogy between Jesus' power to heal and the power of the amulet to heal fever. A, Jerus a Jerusalem hematite now in Oxford University in England depicts a holy rider on a horse spearing a, ba spearing a baby snatching demon as a persuasive analogy to keep one's baby safe with the visual statement, attack, attack my demons too. This amulet in blue glass from the Greek island of Cyprus depicts Daniel between two lions. This is a story from the Bible. Da Daniel is going to be eaten by lions. He prays to God, and then he's, the lions lie down and don't eat him. So it depicts de Daniel between two lions as a persuasive analogy. Protect the wearer as Daniel was protected. The analogies in these contexts are based not on specific theological or scientific tenets, but rather on general ways of knowing, general ways of expressing and getting what one wants. <clears throat> Whenever a strategy for organizing experience, such as persuasive analogy, appears in multiple venues, such as medicine, rhetoric, religion, and magic, and in multiple forms, in texts, images, and objects, then that strategy is part of a larger way of thinking. Persuasive analogy in late antiquity was used to organize knowledge, interpret experience, and then thus shape it. Magical thinking functions well within communities that use persuasive analogy. Magic, along with religion and other practices of faith, is not a matter of being correct or incorrect, because it's not a matter of fact. It's a matter of belief and of expression. The representation of a wish is the representation of its realization. The very existence of this amulet contradicts the gospel text that it represents. The amulet reads, her blood was dried up in the name of her faith. But the amulet's very existence suggests that, at least to the medieval amulet wearer, that faith in Jesus alone was not thought to be sufficient for a cure. The physical amulet itself was sought as a supplement. Faith, in this case, encompassed material culture. It is faith in the power of signs, words, and images. For communities that believed in the power of signs, the representation of a wish is the representation of its realization. Rushing forward. A heroic horseman, here's the horse, the head of the horse, the front legs, the back legs. Here he is with a halo. He has a spear. A heroic horseman violently threatens a demon. Here she is at the bottom with the head of a woman and the body of a lion, and here's his spear. The demon here, thought to kill babies in childbirth, raises her head directly to glance at us as witness of her defeat. This imagery appears on hundreds, maybe more, maybe even thousands, I haven't counted them yet, of late antique amulets, as it, as it transforms the anxieties of parents into the deadly vengeance of a saintly hero. This bronze amulet, now at the University of Michigan, dates from the late antique period and was found in the Eastern Mediterranean. Surrounding the image is an inscription from the biblical psalm, wah, I went forward. Let's go back where I can read it for you. From the biblical psalm, here it is, around here. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the care of God of heaven, and he will say to the Lord. The text continues on the other side, also around the edge. It reads, seal of the living God, guard from all evil the one who wears this phylactery. Phylactery is a fancy word, a Greek word for amulet. At the top is a picture of Jesus in a body halo. Here you see the halo around his head. He's seated on a throne. He holds a gospel book. At the bottom here is a lion. You see his head with his mouth open, his body and his tail, a snake and a scorpion. <clears throat> These animals are mentioned elsewhere 
in Psalm 91 that I just told you about. And in between, in the middle here, this is the best part, are ring signs. <coughs> Those are characters whose arms terminate in tiny rings and may signify the unintelligible speech of angels and demons, what St. Paul called speaking in tongues. It's a language that's written, but it's not spoken by humans, and it's not readable by humans. And I'm working now on perhaps decoding it as a language. <clears throat> Grammatically, the, the, the Greek inscription is a command to the amulet itself, which is called a seal, to guard the wearer of the amulet. It is in the imperative mood. This Psalm ni number 91 is the most common psalm on amulets by far. Below the image of Jesus, here are the words in Greek, agios, 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 or sabaton. It means holy, holy, holy. This is from the Hebrew Bible book of Isaiah. It was used on amulets and in exorcisms, and now is used in the Christian liturgy. This amulet psychological power relies on different semiotic strategies. Speech acts. These are words that are the very actions that they describe. For instance, the phrase, I bet, is an action of betting, and the utterance, I promise, is the promise itself. The inscription on the rider amulet gives a command in direct address. Seal of the living God, guard from all evil the one who wears this phylactery. The command verb guard in Greek, phulaxon, it's in the second person imperative and directly addresses the amulet, commanding it to protect the person who wore it. In this inscription, the imperative command of the word guard is a speech act. Its words psychological power stems from the widely held cultural convention and belief that amulets can protect. This conventional belief in amulets was based in traditional collective structures of authority, rather than on mere wishful thinking of any individual person alone. That's what makes it so useful and powerful. Collective conventions govern individual psychologies and empower speech acts. This holy rider amulet contains a speech act that was widespread, lasting, and conventional. Speech acts in hundreds of magical spells regularly use the imperative form of verbs to issue commands. For example, I've got some other examples for you. In this fifth century Greek papyrus spell, the first word is the verb in command form. Heal your handmaid who wears your name from every disease and fever and shivering and all bewitchment and from every evil spell. And this love spell on a fourth century papyrus Papyrus Codex, that's a, a book, written in the Egyptian Coptic language, which I read, use the command form of the verb cause. It reads, every flame cause in the heart, in the liver, in the belly of my beloved, so that she puts what is in her female parts into my male parts. Quickly, 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 immediately, immediately, immediately. I told you about that immediately business. Images, as well as words, are capable of giving commands. They can be show acts that in initiate the very actions that they depict. In the case of this bronze amulet with the rider and the spear, the action is the defeat of the demon, the one that the person who wore this amulet feared might hurt her own child. Powerful performative images, like this one, are used in everyday life and are familiar to us in religious ritual, in patriotic displays, and even in pornography, in which images are taken for the very things that they represent. If image acts can stand in for the characters that they represent, then this image of a triumphant horseman trampling over a demon does more than just depict the threat, rather it delivers the threat. But as with any show act or speech act, it does so only if the human believer believes in the effectiveness of the images and words. In ancient and medieval Mediterranean worldviews, show acts and speech acts did more than represent, they presented. Let's look at some religious images. 
Within this same worldview, Byzantine Christian holy icons were commonly believed to embody the holy people that they depict. Here you see an image of Jesus holding a gospel book, the archangel Michael, and here we're in a Greek Orthodox church with an iconostasis, a wall of icons between the viewers and the altar. <clears throat> Medieval Christian authors regularly tell of depicted agents, depicted agents, acting upon actual objects, people, of holy icons, <clears throat> like this one of Jesus and the saints, talking, bleeding, and crying as subjects before actual people whom they advise or kill or heal. <clears throat> there are some texts that talk about holy icons killing people, throwing arrows in them. Beliefs about icons were part of a much larger cultural belief about the power of images in general. And this larger cultural belief applies, of course, to amulets as well. The writer amulet creates a relationship between depicted agents, these images here, and the actual objects, the people, saints, or demons. On one side of the writer amulet is depicted these three beasts, the lion here, a scorpion, and a snake that I showed you a few slides back. Now, according to the third century Greek text called the Testament of Solomon, Amulet makers are directed to depict these animals to defeat the evil eye specifically. The amulet's text around the edge, here you can see it's still on the edge, seal of the living God, protect the wearer from all evil, supports this use. Yet the evil eye itself, the evil power that the amulet works against, is not depicted. Let's keep looking. At the top, of the amulet shows Jesus giving a blessing, but not the person who's receiving it. And lastly, the ring signs, these gorgeous bits of language, are addressed to someone powerful, an assumed demonic or angelic presence that is, again, not depicted. The things not present in the image were understood to exist in the world outside of the depiction, in our world, in the world of the people who use this amulet. The actions of the depicted subjects upon actual objects or audiences constitute show acts. I'm making it blank so you'll listen to me rather than look at pictures. The language of amulets and holy icons, and indeed ordinary language, including our own, function through the same ancient ways of perceiving and knowing. The late antique author Sophronius, a bishop from the 6th to 7th centuries, writes about a man named Theophilus who suffered from pain in his limbs. And he was visited in a dream by the doctor saints, Saints uh, Cyrus and John. And the saints instructed this man, Theophilus, on how to find a hidden statue of himself that had pins in it. And after pulling out the pins of this statue, his pain was relieved. So says the medieval author. <clears throat> An eight-sided ring was recommended by the late antique Greek physician, Alexander of Trollis, as a remedy for stomach pain, trusting to the curative powers of the eight-sided shape itself, symbolizing infinity. In certain late antique Mediterranean cultures, <coughs> demons were regarded as real agents of actual deeds. They were also regarded as being able to be slain by effective opponents, namely the powerful words and images that were believed to dominate them. We can never know to what extent someone found physical healing or well-being while wearing an amulet. But it is certain that people's psychological well-being was affected. Why else would thousands of these objects have been produced, bought, used, saved, worn over and over again to be found by archaeologists centuries later? if not for communities of believers who bought and used them. I've outlined only a few semiotic strategies for magical thinking. Persuasive analogy, speech acts, show acts. These are just a small part of exploring how language and images shape human experience. At its heart, 
Magic studies is interdisciplinary because late antique medieval magical thinking was widespread across various social practices. These academic disciplines such as history, art history, linguistics, epigraphy, theology, archaeology, each have their own different academic priorities and find authority in different ways. Magic studies calls for change in how modern scholars identify historical authority. Magic studies also calls for acute attention to our modern scholars' conflicting worldviews within our own notions of authority. Magic studies requires that the scholar self-critique our own intellectual colonization of times past. Self-critique is the allure of magic. Magic is an exploration of our own powerlessness, but it's also an exploration of how we create our own power. Magical amulets and spells were powerfully used to defend against the dark arts, which ancient and medieval people located in demons. The dark arts, end quote, has been understood in several different ways across all human cultures. Throughout history and even in our own present day, fear and danger are understood as evil or demonic by some. I'm presenting historical material evidence of how ancient and medieval people defended themselves against their own demons. But every peoples in every time, culture, and geography fought against their own demons, whether as creatures of the air or as living deep within our own psyches. Where do you locate your demons? Do we carry them within ourselves? How do you defend against the dark arts in ourselves or in others? The Harry Potter books have been meaningful in part because they give us ways to understand, this is for you, Dr. Repolet, because they give us ways to understand our own fears, uncertainties, darkness, our own demons within, and our own power and authority within. Our job as thinkers is to use fiction to reframe our own societal and inner conflicts. Thank you for your attention. And again, special thanks to President Repolet for inaugurating and sponsoring our new art history lecture. Minor in art history. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. So we have this beautiful banquet in the back, but if any of you have any questions or thoughts or something you want to follow up on, tell me now and I can address it to the whole group. It doesn't have to be a question. It can be just something you want to hear more about. Yes? DNL? Very good. DNL asks, are there amulets that are associated with the dark arts? Are there curses? Oh yeah. I didn't show any because they get quite dark. But that love spell I showed you is actually a curse because you're trying to force somebody into having sexual desire or engaging in sexuality with you that you, would, that you don't otherwise have. But there are other curses in the horse races, under, in the Hippodrome, underneath where the horse races took place. There are found amulets buried to trip up horses so that they lose, so that the person betting can win on their horse. And then there are curses to, um, to make people blind if they don't love you. Those are the, the most curses are, are sex curses. Put that wand away. <laughs> that was a great question. But, but most of them are for protection. Now, the early church fathers made magic a four-letter word because they wanted to appropriate that power for their own authority. So they talked about magic, and they coined the term magi, to say, oh, those horrible magicians, they only do evil things. And so they highlighted the curses. But actually, most non-Christian, multi-religious amulets are to help and protect. That was a great question. Yes, sweetie? Oh, the ring signs. OK, so the ring signs. I can show you those pictures here. 
Let's flip on back. So those ring signs are these words. Bye back, Doctor. Wait, let's give him a clap out. Let's give him a clap out. <laughs> so these ring signs, you see here, they look like characters. One character, another character, another character. And you might think, oh, this is an E or an alpha, or maybe this is a K. In Greek, that would be a kappa. Same thing in Coptic, which is ancient Egypt written in Greek letters. But these letters do not belong to any known human language. And in magical, in magical manuals dating to the first century to tell amulet makers how to make these, it says, write these out. These are not speakable by human tongue. But the demons know what you're talking about. So the way to decipher a language is the same way we decipher any language, like hieroglyphics. You collect enough examples. You try and guess relationships. You then put those words in grammatical relationship to each other. Start guessing at what are the nouns, where the verbs, some languages might not have any verbs or nouns. We don't know that. And then look at enough to find patterns. And that's how languages are decoded, just in the beginning stages of it. And you will help me do it once I get a little bit more material together. Yes, sweetie? Oh, the most interesting. Well, this one that I put up here, th this one and This hematite one is my favorite because the stone is so beautiful. And because I'm a woman, and I'm really interested in women's experience. This is obviously about people who have uteruses. Now, in the ancient world, all genders were believed to have uteruses. And so, for instance, if a man had indigestion, he might get a hematite amulet to make his womb stop wandering around his body. <clears throat> and this amulet is at the Met. When I first wrote about it when I was a student, that's when the Met Museum brought it out on display. And now it's on display for you to see. But maybe the most interesting is the one I showed you. This one, because it has the ring signs, it has the Jesus, it has the, the animals, it has the Greek texts, and it has this queen here, the demon Gailu, believed to kill babies in childbirth with the body of a lioness. It's like, I want to meet her. Not the, the Holy Rider. So the ones that I find interesting are linguistically interesting. I like the Greek. I like the Coptic because I word words. But I also like the stories. I think this, this is really um, scary. You know, he's killing somebody, and she's looking at us like, uh-oh, we're the ones doing it to her because we are the ones doing it to her. We're the ones who commissioned this amulet and are wearing it on our bodies. And if we look at this, she's communicating directly with us. The angel's not looking at us. The holy person's not looking at us. She is. So there's like a, an element of danger in that that, that I find exciting. That's right. This, a sphinx threatens the Greek city of Thebes. So you're talking about Egyptian stories, the head of a human and the body of a lion. And sphinxes are also used at, to protect. But they're used to protect, like at the pyramids, you have this giant sphinx to protect the pyramids. But the sphinx protects only because it's such a badass. It's so evil, it protects you from the evil things. And there's a word for that. There's a Greek word for that. It's called apotropaic. When something is so evil, you wear it on your body to protect you from all the other evil things. Like Athena, who wears the gorgon on her breastplate because it's just that dangerous that it protects her. Mike? You are relating to the hematite amulet. Like, obviously, there's a tie between, like, the appearance of that stone and, like, blood. And that ties into, like, the meaning behind the text written on the amulet. In your research, what other kinds of, like, interesting materials, like, relating to, like, what is being depicted on mm -hmm. that artifact did you find? So Michael was asking about materials. So this hematite stone, when you grind it, it looks red. When you don't grind it, some of them have veins. When you polish it, it looks like metal. Um, so it's mercurial. <clears throat> and it was ground and drunk with wine to cure bleeding disorders. But what other stones or materials? 
There are books called lapidaries. Lapidary is the Latin word for stone, which is like an encyclopedia with, lap, with a bunch of stones and then what they're used for. So you have, um, but those lapidaries are not in Greek and they're not late, uh, or, or late antique. They're later. They're in Latin and they're in Western Europe and they're after the year 1000. So I haven't even looked at those yet. Working my way through the centuries. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't have a better answer for you. Beth, what are you thinking? That's such a beautiful question. These amulets were sold. They weren't kept by ritual specialists. So they were sold and found in households. And then, so they were used by people who are not ritual specialists. They're made by people who are ritual specialists. But spells that are used in rituals are part of um, a branch of magic called like esoteric magic, where it takes the, the ritual um, specialist has a lot of knowledge and tries to purify themselves. So dating from as early as the 5th century BCE, but really I can think of several examples in the 5th century CE, where a ritual specialist has given instructions to purify themselves in a ritual, not eating, not having sex for a month, and then making a circle around themselves, and then standing in the circle, and then saying certain words, and, and drawing certain images, and wearing white clothes, to then speak with the angels who were also demons. The Greek word daimon means just these animals who live between heaven and earth. If they're good, they're angels. If they're bad, we call them demons. So then through this ritual practice with the words and images and the outfit and the, and the preparation, you then get to ascend through the heavens. It's called thergy. That's the technical name of this magical practice. To go through the heavens and have a prophecy of heaven and earth, which many prophets have claimed to have done. The prophet Muhammad is believed to have been carried by angels and to a, a rock in Jerusalem and had a, had a prophecy. Moses was believed to have had a prophecy. He didn't talk about thergy, but um, that's how you get to be a prophet. But what, do you, what, do you, what examples were you thinking of? Those are amazing. So there are, are manuals telling you how to do this? That's how you know? Like 1500s, 1600s? Wow. Nice and early. Well, there are um, Babylonian demon bowls that date to like the second century BCE, but most of the ones that survive are fifth and sixth century CE that are clay bowls with an image of the demon in the middle who's bound and then words, a spell around it to trap the demon. And those bowls are typically found in the corners of households when they're excavated because that's where demons can get in, through the corners where there are cracks. So that object doesn't come with a manual, but because it's found there, we can guess at its use. Okay. Any other thoughts? What were you thinking, Dan? Oh, Where does gold magic, come in here? So you're thinking like alchemy, the, which is again a later medieval uh, Western European practice. Yeah. 
There are some gold amulets. Um, The golden amulets I know of show um, the emperor in victory pulling the chariot of the sun. So there the material relates to the iconography. And then that's worn and given you know, as, a, as a blessing. But I can't think of any other use of gold. I think it was just too valuable. Just you know, too valuable. <laughs> Definitely repurposed. Wait, and it's so soft, yeah. Anybody else have any thoughts or, or that they want to throw out there? I'm so happy you came. Thank you so much for coming. I'm so grateful to you. Now, go eat. Go eat.